Terry Barber is a best-selling author and founder of Lighthouse Catholic Media. Jesse Romero is a retired law enforcement officer, a former kickboxing champion with a master's degree in theology. And together, they share a passion for evangelization and PhDs in common sense. You're listening to The Terry and Jesse Show on Immaculate Heart Radio. To join the show, call 888-526-2151. Here's Terry and Jesse. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. (laughs) Pull up a chair, pour yourself something to drink. Let's have a conversation. Today is the feast day of St. Joachim and St. Anne, the grandparents of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. According to a second century tradition, St. Anne and St. Joachim conceived Mary as a gift from God after years of infertility, kind of like Sarah and Abraham. And so devotion to the grandmother of our Lord Jesus Christ, it goes back to around 550 AD when Emperor Justinian built the church in her honor. And St. Anne is frequently depicted teaching Mary to read the scriptures. And that's the tradition of of, of the Jews. St. Joachim and St. Anne are part of a long chain of people who transmitted their faith and love for God, expressed in the warmth and love of family life, down to Mary, who gave that faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, do we got an exciting show today. Big time, man. I can't wait. Because we're talking about uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary gave us Jesus, and Jesus gave us the Mass. I'm going to say it again. Say it again. The Blessed Virgin Mary gave us Jesus, and Jesus gave us the Mass. Have you ever wondered uh, why Mass is celebrated oftentimes differently from one diocese to another, from one parish to another? Great article we're going to lean on from Cardinal Robert, I hope I pronounced it right, Terry will correct me, Sarah. You got it. I think I said it right. Yep, you did. He's, he, he's the African Cardinal. It's called, Could Cardinal Sarah Bring an End to the Liturgy Wars? Let me just make it very simple and we'll get right into the article. You know people who prefer the Latin Mass. I get it. And and trust me, if there was a Latin Mass closer to where I live, I'd probably be going there every Sunday as well. But it's it's downtown Phoenix. I'm not that close. I'm 40 minutes away. But I have a real love for the Latin Mass. Then you have the Novus Ordo Mass. The, the Novus Ordo Mass. And that's basically the Mass after the Council that most Catholics attend on Sunday. Well, Cardinal Seurat... He wants to get the, he wants to get these two Roman rites, and he wants to put them together in some way, shape, or form. So that's what we want to talk about, because there seems to be a rift, and he doesn't want that rift to exist. He wants to meld them together. And I'm all for it. You know, I'm for, 60 years old now, and I started going to daily mass in 1970. Some of you listening weren't even born, right? I started going to daily mass, and what I saw. During my 40 years, I was like scratching my head in the 70s and 80s going, wait a minute, what? this couldn't be possible. I'll give you an example because it happened. At a high school retreat, the priest had gym shorts and a stole on, and he said mass. And I'm looking at him going, Father, why don't you wear your vestments? But I was a teenager. I didn't know any better. So we know that the liturgical renewal after the Second Vatican Council, had some bumps in the road. As a matter of fact, I was so motivated that I ended up finding the last uh, person who participated at the Second Vatican Council on all of the council teachings on the liturgy, the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy. He didn't miss one of them. His name is Abbot Boniface Luke, and he was there, and I said, I've got to go talk to him. So I interviewed him with a a National Catholic Register person, and we recorded three hours. How would you like to meet the last person from Vatican II on the liturgy that was breathing and ask him questions about what went wrong and what should be what is really the authentic teachings of Vatican II on the liturgy? I'm going to give it away, the first CD, but you can get the set for a discount by calling 877-526-2151 because the way you worship is the way you believe. And let me say something, and I'll throw it back in the article. Back in 1965, 75% of Catholics were participating at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. We're down to 20 or 25% and going down fast. Why? Well, Cardinal Seurat, he is the prefect for the doctrine on the liturgy. He's going to give some suggestions, and I would just say, I know I'm going to irritate some people saying these things because... 
I've seen it all my life now. I'm 60. They were always fighting over, hey, can we put our rock band on at the 1030 mass? It was all about entertainment. And I'm scratching my head going, what about the worship of God? And then I'm wondering, why are so few people showing up for mass? In my opinion, and I'll let you, we'll go through this article. I'll tell you why. Because we're worshiping the wrong person. We were worshiping ourselves rather than Jesus Christ. That's my take. I have one statistic here, Terry, and uh, it says in 1962, this is an old study. Yeah. In 1962, the Gallup poll showed 85% of U.S. Catholics responding that they attended Mass once a week. Wow. 85%. That's incredible. Could you imagine? In 1960- now, here's it. When repeated in 2002, Gallup poll showed only 17% of Catholics attending Mass each week. That's pitiful. What? And that's and and the article basically says now Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, he permitted two missiles to coexist, not merely to satisfy the wishes of certain groups of the faithful, but also to allow for the mutual enrichment of the two forms of the Roman Rite. The article says, this is the article, it's not me. In the years since the Second Vatican Council, a rift has grown between the conservative Catholics, those who prefer the traditional Mass and those who attend post-Vatican II Novus Ordo Mass, often singing robust hymns by the St. Louis Jesuits. Now, the article says, are both liturgical forms valid? Yes. Absolutely. Now, here's the way it sets it up. It says, and you, you could probably see this in your own Catholic neighborhood. It says, traditionalist Catholics who prefer the Latin Mass generally wear a mantilla and kneel to receive communion on the tongue often avoid the modernists who have left those traditions behind. The Novus Ordo Catholics who stand to receive the Eucharist, who love the contemporary music of David Haas uh, and Michael Jonkas, uh, often regard their more traditional counterparts as too rigid. Here's where Cardinal Seurat, Robert Seurat, the prefect of the Vatican's Congregation for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments, he's offered a proposal which could unite the two camps of Catholic worshipers. Cardinal Seurat has given us like uh, five bullets to achieve reconciliation between the old and the new forms of the Mass. Among the new ideas for achieving peace, here are the five bullets. Number one, a new shared calendar of feasts, ensuring that the Novus Ordo and the traditional Latin Mass use the same readings each day. So there's unity in both rites. And I'll just throw this out while we're reading this. Today I went to a Latin Mass. It was a Novus Ordo Latin Mass because I'm going to share something that might shock you. The Vatican II document on the liturgy says we're supposed to know our parts of the Mass in Latin. What? You made that up, Terry. No, read it for yourself. Ch- check it out. Do a check, a fact check on it. Yes. Sacred ha- Sanctum Concilium. Yep. Sanctum yeah, Concilium. it says it right there. So we're supposed to know our parts of the Mass in Latin? That's what the Vatican II Council said? Oh, come on. What about the spirit of Vatican II? Forget about the spirit of Vatican II. Read the document, Terry. I was going to say stupid, but I'll say Terry. I I get a little (laughs) excited because the way you worship is the way you believe. Let's go to number two. The second thing that uh, Cardinal Seurat is proposing, he says, an end to the phrase, (laughs) reform of the reform. I don't know if Terry's going to like that. No, no, I know (laughs) what that is. I'm I'm real familiar. Go ahead. Right. That phrase, Cardinal Seurat points out, has become synonymous with dominance of one clan over another. This expression may, they, may, they, may then become inappropriate. So I prefer to speak of liturgical reconciliation. In the church, the Christian has no opponent. So he's suggesting instead using the phrase mutual enrichment of the rights. So I get that. Sure because why. oftentimes... We've been using that reform of the reform for 40 years and stuff. And I, I, I get his point. We're all brothers in Christ and stuff. And I, I like what he's referring to here. Mutual enrichment of the rights. I think it's a very good suggestion. I'll confess right on the air, everybody. I was one of those guys that said the reform of the reform. I admit it. But you know what? I think the Cardinal's right. But you know what? When you're in a fight in the sense of saying, hey, things are going crazy. You're going, wait a minute. Let, let's just take a look at this. This isn't making any sense. So I'm, uh, I want to recommend everybody to go to adoramus.org, which is a liturgical organization that I'm a member of, board member, 
And I would encourage you to go to adoramus.org to get all your liturgical questions answered. This is a great newsletter, and you get lots of good information on the web. Number number three, and this is going to be one that's going to irritate the tar out of some people. But you know what? Have you noticed that here at the Terry and Jesse show we're not politically correct? You know why? I don't care if it bothers you. You know what I care? That you get to heaven and that you, and that you worship God properly and that we all follow the church teachings. Here's what the cardinal is saying. Reception of communion on the tongue while kneeling. Let me just give you an example. Last week, one of our listeners called me from Vegas on the Strip. St. Michael's Parish, I named it. A witch went in, stole the host last Sunday. Okay? She couldn't have done that very easily if, if communion was only on the tongue. I just think it's a practical thing to bring more reverence because here's what I think Cardinal Saray is saying, and which I think is right. If we don't have reverence for the Eucharist, then why go? It's like going to McDonald's and getting fast food. No! But sometimes ask yourself, have you been to church where people act like receiving communion is like an Egg McMuffin? I know that's a sacrilegious thing to say, but you know what? I've seen it. And when I ask people about the real presence in church, they have no clue. So I'm with you, Cardinal Seurat. I believe, and I'll stand right on the radio and say it. You can hit me later. I think bringing back reception of Holy Communion on the tongue and kneeling would be a great thing. If you want to get that end of liturgical uh, reform by the last standing person at the Vatican Council, Abbot Boniface, call us. It's yours, 877-526-2151. That's 877-526-2151. Hey, what else is there to talk about? The way you worship is the way you believe. When we come back, we'll continue. We'll be right back to the Terry and Jesse show on Immaculate Heart Radio. Want to join the conversation? Call 888 526 2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. We're not right versus left, we're right versus wrong. Truth has no color. Speaking of truth has no color, I just want, I personally want to thank uh, President Trump. Today, he, uh, Big news. he banned transgender people from serving in the military in any capacity, and that's the reversal of the Obama administration decision. To me, that just tells me that common sense is coming back. The culture of life is starting to move forward. Uh, people are praying, and people are starting to, uh, to think uh, according to the dictates of right reason. Thank you, President Trump. Going back to Cardinal Seurat, the article, Bringing an End to the Liturgy Wars. He wants to bring the two, he wants the two missiles to coexist uh, in the Roman Rite. And he wants what's called not, not uh, uh, the, the, word that, the word that used to be used is the reform of the reform. He wants us to use the word mutual enrichment of the rights. I like that. Yeah. I think that's, and we're all Christian brothers and stuff, Catholic brothers. Uh, we're not fighting each other. There's, there's no fight here. So I, I, I like the fact that he's trying to bring us together. Here's Well, Terry mentioned something about communion in the tongue. There's a priest, uh, a young priest, Father Andrew Trapp. He wrote an article about the fact that Satanists uh, go specifically to Masses to try to steal the Holy Eucharist. If you want to read that article, go on the Internet. It's called Satanism and the Eucharist. It's by a young Catholic priest by the name of Father Andrew Trapp. And he basically says... That Satanists and witches specifically go to Catholic churches to steal the sacred host. And it's a lot easier now because everybody can receive in the hand. I personally, I per, me, Jesse Romero, me, I have, have you, I'm just wondering if you've done this, but I have done it twice in my life. I have escorted one by force. The other one, I almost had to use force. I've escorted two witches and Satanists out of the Catholic church who are there to steal the sacred host. And they both admitted it to me, and it was pretty easy to see how they were dressed and all the, the wand and the, and, and the candles and, all, and the incense that they had with them in bags. I knew they were witches. So I've had to do this myself. I wonder if you have. Point number five from the article of how to, do, how to mutually enrich both rites in the Roman rite or both, uh, both uh, missiles. Point number five Cardinal Seurat says, The inclusion of prayers at the foot of the altar as was customary in the older form of the liturgy. In other words, he's saying that some of the beautiful prayers that used to be done 
in the older rite mm-hmm. should be brought back into the Novus Ordo. I understand the Novus Ordo wanted to simplify things, but sometimes simple isn't necessarily better. We have our good friend Matt Arnold who's coming out with a book on this well, this topic, so we're going to go to him. But I just wanted to mention, I've got a text, someone asking me about tonight's program. Ralph Martin, uh, president of Renewal Ministries, is going to be our guest at 6 p.m. We're on at 5 and then Bishop David O'Connell, the auxiliary bishop of L.A., you know what he's going to talk about? Are you ready for this, everybody? The devil. The reality of the devil. Yes, the bishop. Yes, he's going to talk about that, so you want to miss that. All right, we want to welcome our good friend Matt Arnold to the Terry and Jesse Show. Hey, Terry and Jesse. Thanks for having me on. We love having you, Brother Matt. And Matt, uh, um, what's on your mind? I think our show might have got your attention, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, I am <laughs> I am not a scheduled guest. I just called in because I was listening to the show. So first off, yes, I'm a Terry and Jesse listener. Good. Uh, but all the, all the things that you were talking about in the first part of the show, I just wanted to mention that um, that adding the, the new feast days into the old calendar mm-hmm. and uh, even using the vernacular for the readings and for the, the prayers of the proper prayers of the day and so forth, um, and the mutual enrichment of the two rites, all of those things are actually in... Pope Benedict XVI's uh, uh, Motu Proprio Samorum Pontificum and the letter to the bishops that came with it. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and again, we, they talk about kneeling for communion when you go to the Old Mass. Well, we're required to follow the rubrics of the Old Mass, which, of course, mandated uh, that you kneel and, and receive on the tongue. So that's, you know, it's, it's not just a, a, a choice that the people make. It's part of the right. Right. Um, also, I, um, I made a couple of notes while you were talking there. You were... Uh, I, it really struck me that what Cardinal Seurat seems to be talking about, and I read the article that was in The Guardian, is, is really um, what Sacrosanctum Concilium called for in the first place. Yep. You know, mm-hmm. and, and perhaps a more faithful celebration of the Novus Ordo Mass, which was also something that Benedict XVI was on about. You know, uh, there's a lot of stuff that priests can do. I, I I'm going to take a moment here for a commercial. I do have a sure. new book coming Tell out called Confessions of a Traditional... Well, it's called Confessions ah. of a Traditional Catholic, mm-hmm. and it's being published by Ignatius Press this mm-hmm. fall. You can pre-order it. You can go to Ignatius.com right now. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> and, and pre-order the book. It'll be out in, in, in the fall. Uh, we're just working on the, on the final uh, edits and stuff right now. Good. But there's a chapter at the end. I call it The Old Mass and the New Evangelization. And I have a whole list of things that priests uh, that celebrate the Novus Ordo Mass can do, all of which are fully approved by the General Instruction of the Roman Missal, uh, all but a couple of which require no special permission, no special training, no money. There's a whole lot of things that priests can do right now today to make the celebration of the Novus Ordo Mass more consistent with the celebration of the traditional Mass. And, and that's in the book, along with some other stuff. But I'm really, I'm really, I just want to call and congratulate you guys for, for taking on this topic, because it is, it's so important in the life of the Church. As you said, Terry, yeah. like Sarandi, like Credendi, the that's way right. you pray is the way you believe. Absolutely. And Matt Arnold, uh, I just want to clarify what rubrics are. Could you share with our audience, because you used the word rubrics, and I think our, our, a lot of us are going, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> well, sure. Uh, well, rubric, uh, it comes from the Latin word that means red, mm-hmm. because in the Missal that the priest uses, uh, all the things that he is supposed to say are printed in black ink, but the things that he's supposed to do, uh, like the stage directions, are printed in red ink. Got it. And so over time they came to be called rubrics. Perfect. And the rubric for distributing communion for the traditional Mass up until 1962 was that the people would receive kneeling out on the tongue. Wonderful. Matt Arnold's new book from Ignatius Press. Go to IgnatiusPress.com to get the book. Matt, I know you were with it's with us at St. Joe when we got uh, Abbot Boniface's interview and we promoted the failure of liturgical yes. reform. He was the, the last standing survivor of the author of the Second Vatican Council's liturgy document, and he lets it all out with an interview answering questions. So if you want to meet somebody that he can't because he's dead, but I was able to, in 1990, interview him for three hours. You're welcome to get that interview, because I think it'll shed a lot of light on the issue. Call 877-526-2151. Matthew Arnold, final thoughts? Well, you know, uh, Cardinal Seurat also talks about, you know, down the future, and maybe somewhere down the road where the two rights would become reconciled and become one Roman right again. But for the meantime... Yeah. They really can enrich each other. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's lots of things that can be done in Nova Soda that are more traditional, and that's, that's easy to do. But, you know, the, the traditional Mass also is enriched by 
um, the celebration of the Novus Ordo, especially, I believe, because in the last 50 years or so, we've really had it gummed into our heads about the active participation. Right. And so, when I, you know, I go to a diocesan mass where they have traditional mass and mass on Sundays, sure. and, you know, they do the, the, the uh, high mass yeah. where the people respond. And you know what most people do? It really isn't that hard to, to learn the responses in Latin <laughs> because you do them every week, you know. Exactly. And, and it's a beautiful patrimony. Right on. Matt Arnold, glad to have you aboard today. Thanks for calling in. God love you, brother. Hey, my pleasure. God bless you guys. You bet. Keep up the good work. Thanks yeah. again. I can't. I can't wait to read that book. That's going to be a good read. Yep. Thanks, Matt. You're doing. You're doing a wonderful service for the church. Amen. Point number five of Cardinal Sarai in this article. It says, the priest, as was customary in the traditional liturgy, should keep his forefingers together after consecrating the host, thus demonstrating the utmost care, reverence, and importance with which the priest regards the body of Christ. Again, like Matt said, that can be done right now. Exactly. You don't, have to, you don't have to be doing the Trinitine Mass to do that. You can do that right now. Any diocesan priest can do that in the Norvis Ordo Mass. And the article says, a new liturgy, which in, that's, here's what Matt just basically yeah, said. Yeah, he the just article said says the same thing. Yeah. Matt just paraphrased the article, basically. I, he must have read it like 20 times. It says, <laughs> a new liturgy which incorporates elements of the of the Latin Mass and the Novus Ordo would incorporate periods of silence, not so that people in the pews can can uh, idly twiddle their thumbs, but rather to encourage adoration and reflection on the mystery. Here's here's now I'm going to speak. Jess, here's where I see the Latin Mass has it right. It, it, it concentrates more on the sacred silence and more of the mystery. And when you have a young person, I have young people that go to the Latin Mass and they come on, they go, Jesse or Mr. Romero, whatever they want to call me, they go, wow, that was different. People weren't clapping after the choir was singing, you know, Bob Hurd songs. And, uh, and, and there was this silence where you can feel the sacred presence of silence. God. Yeah, uh, well, they'll just say silence. They don't know about sacred yet. And I tell them, it's, it's sacred silence. You're feeling the presence of God in a very powerful way. In fact, here, I'll flip it over to Terry, but... If any of you have that booklet oh. called the Pieta, you know that little blue yes. booklet? It's been around for, it's, it's the most sold Catholic prayer book in, in the world. In there, I forget what page it is because I'm sitting on my desk here. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to go grab it on my shelf. But there's a section in there that says this. When a mass is celebrated irreverently, and it quotes St. Thomas Aquinas, it says, you receive weaker graces. When a mass is is is, uh, is celebrated reverently, you receive stronger graces. That's a direct quote from Saint Thomas Aquinas in the Pieta, and it's funny because my wife, you know, we travel a lot. I'm out there doing parish missions. Sometimes we go to weak liturgies, and we just look at each other. And my wife, my wife's funny, and she makes me laugh. We walk back to the car, going back to hotel, or back to the airport, and she says. We just got weak graces right now, and we just have to laugh. <laughs> hey, before we end for the break and then come back, I just want to remind you, if you open up your catechism to paragraph 1136, it's called Celebrating the Church's Liturgy. Take a minute and read that section on the liturgy, and you'll see what we're saying makes total sense. It's right in the catechism, but the secret is how many of us have read that section on the liturgy? Also, I want to also promote Dr. Scott Hahn's How to Get the Most Out of the Mass four CDs or five CDs, I'll give the first one out for free because he takes you right through the Mass. And it's my favorite set by Dr. Hahn. You can get that at a discount by calling 877-526-2151. That's 877-526-2151. Also, pick up The Failure of Liturgical Reform by Abbot Boniface, who was the only man at the Vatican Council for all the sessions. We, re- we interviewed him. We'll be right back. Don't turn that dial. This is Bishop David O'Connell, and you're listening to the Terry and Jesse Show at Immaculate Heart Radio. Back to the Terry and Jesse Show on Immaculate Heart Radio. Want to join the conversation? Call 888-526-2151. Now here's Terry and Jesse. Do you realize that the oldest consistent form of worshiping God is the holy sacrifice of the Mass? Did you know that? The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass was celebrated today in every country on planet Earth. There's 198 countries. Today, the worship of the proper worship of God was celebrated in every country in the world. No religion was celebrated in every country of the world today. 
None. And some people say, well, you guys invented this this mass thing during Vatican II. Really? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see how old the mass is, it, the first mass was the Last Supper, so it's right in your Bible. Okay? If you read the Last Supper accounts, that was the first mass. And if you want to read when the mass was actually described what went on in what's called the Lord's Supper or the Holy Mass or the Sacred Liturgy. St. Justin Martyr, he actually, he was asked this by the pagans back in 155 AD. The pagan emperor Antoninus, he basically, basically asked him, Hey, Justin, what do you Christians do on Sunday? You guys seem to hide out for a couple of hours. He said, he told Emperor uh, Antoninus, this pagan emperor, this is what we do on Sunday. And then he describes exactly the Mass, the four parts of the Mass. If you want to read that, it's in paragraph 1345 of the Catechism, where the Mass was described in 155 A.D. to a pagan emperor. Justin Martyr said, Emperor, this is what we Christians do on Sunday. We'll get back to the article, but I want to do a, a reading from the Catechism, paragraph 1069. What does the word liturgy mean? This isn't Jesse or Terry. This is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It says, paragraph 1069, the word liturgy originally meant a public work or a service in the name of, on behalf of the people. In the Christian tradition, it means the participation of the people of God in the work of God. Through the liturgy, Christ, our Redeemer and High Priest, continues the work of our redemption in, with, and through His Church. How many people come to Mass and realize this, that we're present at that one eternal sacrifice of Calvary? I guarantee you that catechesis has not been communicated well enough to our flock. You know why I know that? For 40 years I asked people, what do they believe about the Mass or about the Eucharist? And nine out of ten people can't tell me the correct answer. And I know I'm not in management. I'm in sales, okay? I'm not a bishop. I'm not a priest. I'm just a layman who loves Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. And I want to help people understand the Mass. Because when they come out of Mass and they have that deer in the eye look, you know, like they, well, I didn't, we just went to, like, you know, I was just going to go to some service. It ain't a service! The Mass is a sacrifice. It's bringing us back to Calvary. I mean, if we could get that drilled into people's heads, I believe people would be flocking because we have a natural natural tendency to want to worship God, okay? But when we make the Mass not so much a worship, but a worship of us, where we just have the best rock band playing, that's not going to feed you. Jesus Christ is who we serve and who we worship. And I know that sounds like I'm being a little hard, but you know what? After 40 years of going to daily Mass and seeing what I've seen, I'm just telling you what I've seen and what I've experienced. So it's kind of hard to argue with me because I see this and I just want the best for people. And I want them to understand that going to Mass, you're going to be at Calvary. And what a great privilege and honor it is to receive Holy Communion weekly or even daily. That's how excited I am about the Mass. In one sentence... If you want to understand what is the sacred liturgy or Holy Mass, here it is in one sentence. Holy Mass is the once and for all sacrifice Ooh. of Calvary made present That's Bishop Sheen, yeah, right in the eternal yep. now of sacred time. Wow. Repeat that. I just said a mouthful Re- repeat right it, now. Repeat I just it. said a mouthful. Let me say that again. Okay. Here it is. One sentence. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sum up the power of the Mass. Here Ooh. it is. Praise God. Holy Mass, or the Sacred Liturgy, are called both, is the once and for all sacrifice of Calvary made present in the eternal now of sacred time. Close quote. I'm just quoting El Cresta, okay? In other words, we're not sacrificing Jesus again. It's that same sacrifice that already occurred that's made present. It's kind of like, I know it's, it, all analogies fail to capture the power of the Mass, but it's like getting a DVD or, or, or a video right. of uh, you know Football. the World Series yeah. last year. Yep. And you say, hey, let's sit down and watch last year's uh, 2017, 2015 or 2016's World Series. Let's watch it. We didn't watch it as a family. And you put it on and you watch it. And you make that event that happened a year ago present in your living room now. 
that's by way of analogy, in some you know paltry way, what happens at Holy Mass. Calvary now comes to your parish. And that's why, to me, I scratch my head when I see a lot of the irreverence, a lot of the chattering, a lot of the, you know, uh, a, a lot of the unnecessary uh, ac- activity that goes on. We should be there because we are with Mary, John the Apostle, in sacred silence, beholding redemption that occurred at hand. If you'd like also to have a catechesis on the Mass by Archbishop Sheen, get Life is Worth Living. It's all there. I was, you know, I'm just sitting excited to hear about this. But we have our good friend James, who's non Catholic, who's calling in on our show periodically. I know him well. He's a good man. James, welcome to the Terry and Jesse show. You're not Catholic, but you go to Catholic Mass, so I'm, I'm interested in, to hear what's on your mind. Yeah, this was on my high turn, Jesse. Uh, this was on my mind. I want to have a question, but, but I want to first put it in the context. Here's, my, here's the, what happened, and then I need a question. You know, I went to this church uh, about three weeks ago. It was on up by Barack on in Cameron. It was yeah. a Catholic church and had Eucharistic adoration. Yes. So the night before that I was going to go, I was asking myself, what would happen if somebody told me, you know, James, tomorrow you're going to, become, you're going to come before Jesus Christ and you're going to be in his presence. You know, I got kind of scared. I go, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? So I, I dressed up and everything. And when I walked in there, I felt uneasy. And I'll tell you why I felt uneasy, because I remember what happened to the ark when it was brought to Jerusalem, when Uzzah inadvertently reached out because the oxen killed the, killed the ark, and he reached out and he touched it, and he was struck dead. Yeah. So with that thing in my mind, I went in there and said, I didn't know what to do, I'll be honest. I didn't know what to do. I, I never done this. So I, I fell on my knees right away, and yes. the room was kind of bright, had candles, and I just started saying the rosary. I haven't been, haven't been back since because I'm really afraid, because when I go to church and I sit there, I look at that Eucharist, and I say, my goodness, that's Jesus Christ Amen. in that Thing. And I tell myself, I would be terrified to offend him in any way. So I want to do it right. So my question to you is this. Sure. Uh, do I have to know Latin to go to Latin Mass? Because I want to do it right. And uh, is it wrong when I do pass RCIA? Can I get on my knees and, and take my, you know, put my tongue on and receive the Eucharist? I mean, what's the probably? I want to worship God Absolutely, the correct yeah. way. Great, great question. James, yeah. that particular place, I go on a regular basis. It's Mother Lily's, the Trinitarian Sisters. It's actually a convent, and, and people in Southern California come all over the all over the Southern California to go to that chapel. And I and I, so it's, it's great that you're going there, make visits, uh, do adoration. Obviously, you are in full communion with the Catholic Church to receive Holy Communion. We would love to see you... Uh, be a Catholic so you can receive, but I do have a pamphlet here in our offices in Covina. You could come up and pick up. It's a missile to follow the Latin Mass, and I'll be happy to give it to you so that when you go to a Latin Mass, you can follow it. As a matter of fact, James, are you ready for this? What's what is that? today, Tuesday? We have a Latin Mass next Wednesday here at the Sacred Heart Chapel at 9 o'clock. What? You're telling the whole world? I am. <laughs> I am. Yeah, I got oh, nothing. To, yeah, so I want you to come next Wednesday at 9 a.m. to our Mass here at the chapel at Sacred Heart. It's a Nova Ordo Latin Mass. I've got the pamphlets for you. Brother, I can't wait for the day that you come into the church and you can receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Because so many of us Catholics don't appreciate it. And here you are, as a non-Catholic, showing reverence that puts many Catholics to shame, brother. Thank you. Jesse, your thoughts? James, you, uh we're, we can't wait to receive you into full communion into the Catholic Church. And I just want to go through the microphone right now and give you a big, holy, <laughs> brotherly bear hug Amen. and welcome you home. Uh, also, most of the most of the missiles that have the Latin Mass, the ones that I've seen, like the one that Terry has and others, yeah. they have the English translation That's right. That's on, on, the, on the right side. Yep. So you can actually see what you're saying in Latin, and you know, after you say it like ten times, you're gonna you're gonna know exactly. It. Oh, this is the Our Father. Oh, this is the Glory Be. Oh. You're gonna memorize it because the translation is on the next page, so you know what you're saying, and uh, and and so very very in, in very short order, you're gonna become very familiar with it. Absolutely. James, we're so glad you oh. called. I'd love to see you. I'm going to be here today. We're going to be back on the radio at 5 o'clock till 7 o'clock, uh, helping Joe Sakura's show out while he's on vacation. 
Yeah, but uh, you you got my cell number. Are you ready? I know, Terry, you're crazy. 661-972-7872. I had 128 calls yesterday. Yeah, I was tired at 9 o'clock, but I said, I got to go pray, everybody. Why do I do this? I'm com- I'm passionate about one thing, helping people find a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and to come in to get to heaven. That's my role right now, to help people fall in love in Jesus- with Jesus Christ. James, thanks for your call. Hope to see you today or tomorrow. God love you, brother. Okay. Thanks, James. Wow. Jesse, does that inspire you, a non-Catholic, telling us I, about you? I'm floored right oh, now. Sh- I'm floored. Thank this you, is Jesus. a Protestant talking about the real presence. God is bringing his people that's what God is doing. God is just bringing people back to the fullness of truth, despite the human frailties of the Catholic Church. Yep. Despite the human scandals. By the way, uh, somebody asked a good email question. Uh, they said, Jesse, can I pray these this chain letters, a chain letter prayer? Can a Catholic pray these chain letter prayers? If you want my response, can you, you know those chain letters that you get? If you say 10 Hail Marys and 5 Our Fathers and for 9 days straight, this will happen to you. Can a Catholic pray those prayers? Go to my blog, jesseromero.com blog. You'll get the answer. This is Dr. Scott Hahn, and you are listening to the Terry and Jesse Show on Immaculate Heart Radio. Have you ever heard that word, mystical body of Christ? Okay mystical body of Christ. And if you want, you ever, you ever wondered, well, what does that mean? Okay, I've heard of the body of Christ, but why mystical? Archbishop Sheen, he answers it today. It's called how the church grows. He talks about where that, why that word is appropriate to add mystical body of Christ. If you want to know why we should say mystical, go to my blog, jesseromero.com. It's Daily Reflections with Archbishop Fulton Sheen. Going back to today's topic, somebody was asking, I think, about kneeling. Yeah, James was. We're going to answer his question. Oh, yeah, James. About uh, Revelation uh, 5. Yeah. Well, it, it, first of all, it's, it's all over the Bible. Yeah. In, in Revelation chapter 5, you have, it says that, that the 24 elders are before the throne of God. And it says that they fall down. They go prostrate. And it says that they worship the Lord in his throne. Day and night, night and day. If you want to know where that's at exactly, it's in Revelation chapter 5. I'll just read it to you. Yeah, read it. Verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, this is Jesus, the four living creatures, these are angels, and the 24 elders, these are saints in heaven, fell down before the Lamb, that's Jesus, each holding a harp and with golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. Look at what it says here. They fell down before the Lamb. The Hebrew word, it says they went prostrate. Uh, Also, St. Paul talks about kneeling at the name of Jesus in Philippians chapter 2. St. Paul says, Every knee shall bend and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, if you want some liturgical ammunition, the general instruction of the Roman Missal, I just pulled it up, Paragraph 160, it says here, it, The norm established for the Diocese of the United States of America is that Holy Communion is to be received standing unless an individual member of the faithful wishes to receive Holy Communion while kneeling. So that's from the U.S. Bishop's General Instruction of the Roman Missal. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I want to bring up well, Fr- Frida from Salt Lake City. We're running at the end of the show. She asked the question, She's a convert, recent convert, and a lady told her that the Latin Mass was a sin. See, that's what we're talking about, this battle that could, that could Cardinal Sara bring an end to liturgical wars. You know, whenever anybody says something as crazy as that, we call that the spirit of Vatican II. They, if they ever say that word to you, run! Don't listen to anybody who says the spirit of Vatican II says this. Read the document, Frida. And I, I encourage you, again, to go to adoramus.org. It's a great organization that gives you liturgical questions and answers as a newsletter. Sign up for it because you'll get some good material on that. Uh, again, we're short on time, but this article is on our website, jesseromero.com or, or the catholicrc.org. And I want to remind you, for the whole week we've been on the air. That's why I'm getting a lot of phone calls. Uh, we're taking the place for this week of Joe Socorro while he's on vacation in Alaska. Terry and Jesse shows picking it up from 5 o'clock to 7. 
And we're going to be talking on spiritual warfare. Also, Ralph Martin is going to be talking about about salvation, one of the great men. And Bishop O'Connell is going to jump in and talk about the reality of the devil. When was the last time you had the bishop on the air talking about the devil? I'm saying, God bless Bishop O'Connell. I mean, for him to come on and talk with us to do this, he's got a love for you, and I want you to experience that. So join us again at 5 o'clock on Immaculate Heart Radio. There's also another great article we're not going to get to. It's called Silence and the Meaning of the Mass by Bishop Robert Barron. He basically backs up everything that Cardinal Seurat is saying. Everything. So it's called Silence and the Meaning of the Mass by Bishop Robert Barron from the Diocese of Los Angeles. Yep. He, 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 he talks about the power of silence. He backs up everything that Cardinal Seurat is saying. Let me go back to Cardinal Seurat's article. We're almost yeah. done. <laughs> basically, the, the article, and you know what? I better quit saying the word basically. My son, he, he just scolded me the other day. He goes, Dad, you keep saying that word. Use something else. Sorry, Josh. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, he says, use another word. So Cardinal Seurat... In this article, what he's doing, he's following the footsteps of his teacher, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, called Pope Benedict XVI. That's what he's doing. Everything that he's saying here is basically an implementation of the motto proprio sumanorum pontificum that was given to us by Pope Benedict. And Cardinal Seurat simply trying to uh, implement what he wrote. It says He says here in the article, to the supporters of the old rite, Cardinal Seurat stresses that the liturgy is not a museum object that must never change, and he argues that those attending the extraordinary form must participate actively through their prayer and attentiveness, and that the scripture readings, which are often read in Latin, must be understood by the people in the pews. Then he says this, as for those attending the newer post-Vatican II liturgy, that's the majority of us, that's my comment, mm-hmm. Cardinal Seurat hopes that the priest will take a less prominent role. He wants to see a large cross on the altar, and he hopes that this cross will be seen by everyone and will become a point of reference for all. I think what he's saying is we don't want the priest to be the point of reference or the band. We want Jesus Christ to be the point of reference. I I agree with that totally. You know, there's a book that Cardinal Ratzinger wrote that Ignatius Press printed, The Spirit of the Liturgy by Joseph Ratzinger, who's Pope Benedict XVI, Emeritus Pope Benedict XVI. So I would recommend getting online to Ignatius Press, pick up that Spirit of the Liturgy. Also, I've got something that I'd say to everybody, how would you like to meet one of the fathers of the Vatican II Council from 55 years ago who was at every session on the liturgy? What? You can meet him because I recorded his interview for three hours. I went up to see Abbot Boniface. He's dead now. Can't do it except listening to his interview. I want to give the first CD away, but I think you're going to want to get this because it's going to shed a lot of light on the liturgy. It's called The Failure of Liturgical Reform by Abbot Boniface. You can call 877 877- Five two six two one five one, and if you want a really good set on how to get the most out of the mass, get Scott Hahn's CD five CD set by Scott Hahn. We'll discount that for you. Call eight seven seven five two six two one five one, or go online to catholicrc.org. And one final thought by Bishop Barron, then I'll turn it right over to Jesse. I think one of the most profound statements Bishop Barron ever made was on Immaculate Heart Radio. I have it documented on a Sunday. He said. It is a sign. Now, this isn't Terry Barber speaking. This is Bishop Robert Barron. He says, it is a sign of a corrupt church that stops thinking deeply about the truths of Christianity. A church that is against being precise about its teaching is a corrupt church. So when you're not precise about the liturgy, that's a corrupt church. That's how I read it. Here's also what Bishop, uh, he's from Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, Robert Morlino. But he started in his diocese back in October 2016. He started celebrating Mass ad Orientum. What What does that mean? mean? Ad Orientum means that the Mass is celebrated mostly facing liturgical east or with the priest facing the altar rather than the people. This was the norm for the Latin Rite liturgy for centuries until Vatican II when the priest started turning towards the people. That became the norm. Even though that's not in the documents, that just kind of just was uh, incrementally came in. And uh, Bishop Morlino, he's basically encouraged people. He wants to follow Pope Benedict XVI and Cardinal Seurat. 
regarding this ad orientum. Yep. And he says this. He's, and here's the theology behind it. And it's solid. He says, God's plan is at the end of history, Jesus will come from the east. That's right. From the rising sun. So Bishop Orlino says this. And when the priest stands together with the congregation, not with his back towards them, that's not the point. Exactly. The point is the priest stands together with the congregation and he faces symbolically at least the east. We become, Richard Merlino says, we become a mighty army during Mass, marching towards the place of the rising sun to meet the Lord led by the priest. That's who we really are. As we offer the Eucharistic sacrifice, we, during Mass, march towards, to, march together towards the east to go run and meet the Lord who comes from the east at the end of history. And then Bishop Merlino ends this by saying, Now... No general, and the priest is like the general at the mass. That's right. He goes, now, no general ever led his troops by facing them and walking backwards. What a what common a great, sense statement. Yes, okay. and you know what I also <laughs> noticed about the bishop? He says, I'm not going to force any priest to do anything. Yeah. I don't want them to be angry saying mass. That's uh, that darn bishop. No, it might say something even stronger. They shouldn't be thinking of that when they're saying mass, if I can help it. Rather, he wants to lead why, where, where, by example, like we should. But we're going to begin because that we will make our worship more reverent and make it clear to focus on God and his mind, his ways, and the absolute mystery. And that's not our opinions. See, the, hear what we just did, everyone? Each of you listening, you just heard what the Catholic Church teaches about the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And I hope on Sunday when you go, you can think about these things. And whether you pick up Scott Hahn, How to Get the Most Out of the Mass, or Abbot Boniface about the failure of the liturgical reform, you can call 877-526-2151 and get those. But I really want to share this with you because the Mass, as the Vatican Council says, is the source and summit of the Christian life. And Bishop Barron says pretty much the same that Bishop Morlino says. In, this, in the, the article, Bishop Barron says this. He says, The Mass is the act by which the Son of God, in union with his mystical body, that's us, yep. tur- here it is, turns towards the Father in worship. Ah, yep. hear what he just said? Yep. Turn towards the Father in worship. So through our full conscience and active participation in this right praise, we, the laity, become more rightly ordered, more completely configured to Christ, and more thoroughly directed towards the Father. So again, Bishop Barron is basically backing up what Bishop Morlino is saying about the ad orientum, and he's also backing up with Cardinal Robert Seurat and Pope Benedict XVI talk about the, the theology of ad orientum. We will hear, you will hear from us in five hours, God willing, on the Joe Socorro Show. We'd love to have you come back for two more hours with... Ralph Martin and Bishop David O'Connell. Full sheen ahead. God love you.